E3 members, I'm excited about this two-part segment. I was able to sit down with Captain Sterling Gillum and Hill Goodspeed. Hill is the historian here at the National Naval Aviation Museum, and Sterling is the director. We're going to talk about something you might have seen out there in the movie theaters, Devotion. Here, right behind me, we have the set from the movie Devotion, and we're able to sit down and talk at a little bit deeper level about the tie to the museum, the movie, Jesse Brown, as well as a deeper dive into naval aviation's impact and history with the Korean War and the Chosen Reservoir. So you want to stick around and check out these two segments. What's up, E3 members? Here in Pensacola, Florida at the National Naval Aviation Museum, I'm sitting with the director, Captain Sterling Gillum. Sir, thanks for joining us. Before we get going, I think I gotta mention it, 1,307 carrier arrested landings. Did I get that right? You're kind, you're kind. Yes, that number's correct. <laughs> it's, I just hung around like bad weather and never turned down a flight. Secret <laughs> to a high trap total. I love it. I hope you're enjoying this content. And if you are, we have lots more in store for you. If you'd like us to release it over here on YouTube, drop a comment down below. Let us know what you like about it. And if you're not a member of E3 Aviation Association yet, consider clicking the link down below. Come over and join our community. It's an awesome group of aviators and people passionate about aviation just like you. Well, we're sitting here and today we're going to talk about the F4U. We're going to talk about the movie Devotion and a new display or a new exhibit you guys have here at the museum, which I think is pretty powerful. And I want to turn it over to you to talk a little bit about how this came about and some of the nuts and bolts about the story. Well, we're very, very excited about it. We're sitting in front of the museum's newest exhibit. It's technically called the Korea exhibit, but it's colloquially known as the devotion exhibit by the movie and the book of the same name. The book details the remarkable story of Thomas Hudner and Jesse Brown. Jesse Brown being the first African-American naval aviator and his wingman and squadron mate, uh, Thomas Hudner. Two entirely different people from two different uh, walks of life. Uh, as we know, Truman, de President Truman, desegregated the military right after World War II. And Jesse Brown, son of a sharecropper from Mississippi, decided he wanted to be an aviator. Graduated high school in 44, uh, went to Ohio State. And he went to Ohio State in part because Jesse Owens, had had success at Ohio State a decade prior and found himself uh, with a gold medal at the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. So Jesse goes through flight school. And you can imagine the challenges for an African-American yeah. male in the late 40s to go through flight school. He successfully gets his wings, joins uh, VF-32. Uh, they're flying Bearcats at the time. One of the squad, he's still an ensign at this point. And, and it's important to note Brown did not graduate from Ohio State. Instead, he moved over to the Flying Midshipman Program, which was designed by the Navy to get more people into the pilot program sooner. So that's one of the reasons he was still an ensign uh, when he got his wings in 48. Gets to VF-32. Hunter had gotten there a little bit ahead of him, a Naval Academy grad, grew up in an affluent family in the Northeast. Uh, very great guy, but they be quickly became friends in VF-32. They're deployed on the USS Leyte, and they're in the Med. They're having a great Mediterranean deployment. Korean War breaks out. They move over to the Korean area of uh, responsibility. And in December of 50, they're flying combat air support for the Marines who were decisively engaged in the Chosen Reservoir. War. Uh, and on 4 December, they're flying as a flight of four Brown takes him anti-aircraft fire and is forced to crash land his airplane in Korea. It's late in the afternoon, it's December 4th, it's getting dark, it's cold. Uh, the flight, which included Hudner circling overhead, looks down to see that Brown had successfully landed the airplane, but the force of the impact had him trapped in the cockpit. The rescue helicopter was 30 minutes away. They could see smoke coming out of the cowling. Thomas Hudner made an incredibly brash decision at that point to crash land his own F4U Corsair in the vicinity of Brown to go rescue his wingman. He, he gets to the uh, cockpit. Brown is barely conscious. Uh, he puts the wool cap, which you'll notice on his head, uh, wraps his scarf around his hands because it is bitterly cold, and proceeds to try to get Brown out of the cockpit. Can't do it pulling Brown's in pain. 
the rescue helicopter lands, they break out sledgehammers and still are unable to get Brown out of the cockpit. Now again, this is 1950, so the helicopters were literally first generation. And with the Chinese forces closing in, losing light, the helicopter pilot says, we're not, not capable, we will die here if we stay. Uh, Hunter goes over to Brown, comforts him, and Brown's last words were, tell Daisy that I love her. Daisy was his wife and mother of their young child, uh, Pamela, that was here. And it was just remarkable. Hudner crestfallen, they leave, they get back to the Marine encampment, he gets back to the ship uh, a couple of days later, fully expecting for the skipper of the squadron to court martial him for hazarding his airplane. Instead, he was put in and received the Congressional Medal of Honor. Pretty remarkable story. That really is. There are stories like Air Force wise talk about the Pardo push, where his wingman was hit and Pardo pushed him across the line, but damaged his F-4 in the process, and they're yeah. both ejecting, uh, and there was some turmoil with that. I can't imagine, one, the decision to crash land your plane, the bravery, the guts it would take to do that, because you're not guaranteed. Right, you're gonna, exactly. You're, I, tell me what, yeah, tell your me. Your own life, he's definitely hazarding not only the airplane, but his, but his life. I had an opportunity to hear Hudner speak on the opportunity of Centennial of Naval Aviation in 2011. He was speaking at a Telex symposium. And in the Q&A, someone asked, what, why do you think to do that? And you could heard a pin drop in the place, but he goes, he's my wingman. I felt I really didn't have a choice. He would do the same for me. That's incredibly powerful, because again, I kind of go back to, we talk about ejection decisions in, in fighters, when you're gonna eject. Mm -hmm. And one of those things you have to talk about for an Air Force guy on a fixed runway that's not moving around is if your aircraft's going to depart right. a prepared surface, what speed, what's your threshold for ejecting? And I always said in F-16, if I'm going off more than a jog, I'm getting out. Because when you start looking at just the train at a prepared airfield off the sides of the runways, you might have a 20-foot culvert right there and you're not going to survive it. So then to take that into you know, combat into a threat environment where wingman was just shot down into the mountains. Right. Y you're not- Nighttime, yet. late in the afternoon. Are you gonna flip uncertain. that? Yeah, yeah. That, the bravery it took to do that is pretty it, incredible. It did, and we were, a remarkable story. And one of the things that's interesting, and the story is reasonably well known in naval aviation circles, but until the book and certainly until the movie, it was not that widely uh, known. And one of the things we're excited about in naval aviation is for our given vocation to play a part in advancing uh, the conversation on race in America about an event that happened 72 years ago. Put another way, the folks in VF-32 figured it out. We can too. And the story is pretty remarkable, both the book and the movie, about how much VF-32 embraced their squadron mate, Jesse Brown. Some examples, they'd go, on, they'd go into port uh, in the Mediterranean, and if Brown wouldn't get served, the entire squadron would get up and leave. It's pretty remarkable. And then obviously, Hudner's actions speak for themselves here. Absolutely, you were able to obviously acquire this F4 piece. It's a remarkable yeah. story. What you see behind you, the fuselage, is not a Navy aircraft. It is a movie prop. Okay. And Black Label Media, who's the production company uh, that, that did the movie in conjunction with Sony, is they're breaking down the set. And we'd had a relationship uh, with, but interestingly, through FedEx, believe it or not, Fred Smith's daughters, Molly and Rachel, are both executives of Black Label Media. So in the conversation between the two organizations, they said, uh, hey, we're breaking down the set, would you use some of the fuselage? And we go, absolutely. And we decided that we would use it to help invigorate our Korea story. Korea is known to many as the forgotten war. Well, in this museum, it was kind of the forgotten exhibit, and we viewed that we had a wonderful opportunity to rehack our Korea story and, and better tell the remarkable story of Hudner and Brown as kind of the detonator for that story. So we acquired it in, in December of 21, made some plans. 
Where we're sitting now was just open flooring six months ago, eight months ago. And our staff, who loves to bend metal and make <laughs> sawdust, they came and we're, through several iterations, we came up with the exhibit that you see here that, that details the intimacy, the starkness, uh, and the grandeur of what transpired on that December day. And you've been able to host some of the family members here. We were, and again, through that relationship with Sony, they were kind enough uh, to give us an advanced screening of the movie, Devotion. It, it uh, released uh, worldwide over Thanksgiving Day weekend. They were kind enough to come here uh, October 29th. Uh, we had an advanced screening. It was coincident with a Hall of Honor and Triumph. This museum is not only the National Naval Aviation Museum, but it is a repository for the Naval Aviation Hall of Honor. And to put that in perspective, Naval Aviation's been around for 111 years and we've enshrined less than 100 uh, people. But on that night, uh, before the uh, advanced screening, we enshrined Hudner Brown, along with two other Korea uh, heroes, John Magda, who was one of the first Navy Flight Demonstration Squadron uh, commanding officers and Navy Cross recipient, in Korea, and John Kelch, who is the first Rotary Wing Congressional Medal of Honor recipient in the Department of Defense, who received that award for a night, for a combat search and rescue attempt in Korea, again, early stages of helicopters. So that enshrinement happened that evening. We had some of the cast here, uh, Glenn Powell was kind enough to spend some time with it. J.D. Dillard, who was the producer, was very gracious. When he saw this, he was so happy because he was very invested in the movie. His father was a former Blue Angel, was the events coordinator, and was one of the first African Americans on the Navy flight demonstration team. So that movie was very personal to him. And when he saw that that prop, that he had spent so much time bringing that story to life, was going to live on here. It was pretty good. And J.D.'s dad was here as well. So it was just a wonderful evening. Um, and then we capped it off with a, a wonderful speech by Major General Pat Brady, who uh, was a Army helicopter pilot who received his Congressional Medal of Honor for multiple combat search and rescues in Vietnam. Great evening. That's incredible. And, you know, for me, and I think you probably can, I know you can appreciate this, I obviously love the planes, but I really love hearing the story and when you can connect a personal story to something like this, which throughout the museum, those stories live and exist and you've been able to bring family members back in various ways. And to me, that's just so powerful. Well, we appreciate you you recognizing that because this magnificent hardware and all these airplanes, it's great, but it's the people that are behind the story. And we, we had Hudner's son here, Thomas Hudner III, we had Jesse Brown's daughter, granddaughter, and great-granddaughter uh, here. Interesting story to that point. Uh, this, this exhibit wasn't open yet, but part of the, of the exhibit is a video of Thomas Hudner giving a panel and describing this event. It's so powerful. You'd love it when you come see it, yeah. and it's fully up because you hear Hudner's voice rolling over this exhibit, describing the intimate details of that day. And as daughter Pamela was turning the quarter, and she's in her late 70s now, she heard the voice and she goes, is that Tom? And it dawned on me at that point that those two families, since that event, December 4th, 1950, had been tied at the hip together. They are close family friends, one from Massachusetts, one from Mississippi. And it was really, really gratifying to see that relationship across those two families endure for all these decades. I think you made a good point too with these type of connections you find in the military. And I know, again, you can relate to it just like I can, but there's some pretty powerful connections and stories that come out of it. And people from, you know, I'm from Georgia, but you become best friends from someone right. from California, completely different socioeconomic backgrounds, but you really kind of, you peel back the onion and you really get to see the character of a person when you get put in these situations and it forms some pretty strong bonds. Well, it took me six pay grades to fully appreciate <laughs> this, but I've come to believe Naval Aviation is a family 
business knitted together not by biology or genetics but by you know, common purpose, like ideals, and shared sacrifice. And the really, really cool thing about that family is you don't necessarily have to wear a flight suit to be part of it. Spouses, family members, industry partners, they're all invested in this vocation of military aviation. And as you said, it's pretty remarkable, the, the bonds that are developed over that time, and it's special. And we love here at the museum to be able to capture those stories and tell them to the larger public. Yeah, I think when you have a mission, when you have a purpose and everyone is fighting to get to that objective, same way, same day, and everyone wants right. to win, that's really when you see all the frivolous stuff right. and all the noise, not necessarily it's frivolous, but there is a lot of noise out right. there in society today. There is a lot of noise, in it. and again, that's why this story, which happened seven decades ago, is so remarkable because those relationships developed in VF-32 uh, are, are important and speak to today's issues. Well, sir, I really appreciate you taking the time again, just tell us a little bit of the background. I have not seen the movie yet. I got to see the movie as we're recording this, it's right after Thanksgiving. Yeah. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that and, and learning a little bit more. So thank you again. You bet, thank you. Well, E3 members, we got a lot more coming your way. I hope you enjoyed this segment and we'll see you next time.